Good afternoon. My name is Janie Montblanc, and on behalf of the Great Basin Fire Science Exchange team and our partners, I would like to welcome you to our first webinar of the fall 2015 season, titled Sagebrush Step Treatment Evaluation Project Six-Year Update, presented by Jim McKeever with Oregon State University. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to let you know that you may type questions for the speaker at any time during the webinar by typing your questions into the questions pane of your control panel located at the top right of your screen. I will keep these questions in the queue and field them after the presentation. I also want to let you know that whatever you do in your control panel does not affect the webinar presentation, so you're welcome to type a test message or test your audio at any time during the webinar. If you're having problems with your audio, please open your audio pane and check your audio selections. Now I would like to introduce our presenter. Dr. Jim McKeever is an ecologist at Oregon State University in Corvallis and is the coordinator for the Sagebrush Step Treatment Evaluation Project. He conducts research on ants, butterflies, and on arthropod predator-prey relationships. His work in natural resources includes research on the ecological effects of post-fire logging, and he has also directed two large research projects on the environmental effects of other management practices, the National Fire and Fire Surrogate Study from 2000 to 2010 and the Sage Step Study from 2005 to present. Welcome, Jim, and thank you for presenting today. Thank you, Janie. Let me get the presentation up. Yeah. There we go. All right. Uh, thank you all for joining in uh, today. Um, I'm going to try to speak uh, until about uh, 10 till 1 and then uh, field questions at that point. Hopefully I can um, get through the material by then. Um, I'm assuming that um, some of you probably are aware of uh, this project, uh, know about it, others don't, so I have to uh, do a, a short introduction. And then I'm going to concentrate on some six-year results with the major theme being uh, the meaning of restoration. So SAGE-STEP is uh, funded by the Joint Fire Science Program originally and uh, uh, currently being funded by the BLM and the National Interagency Fire Center with a little bit of money from the, uh, the uh, LCCs. Again, six-year results. Uh, more information, you can always go on our website, sagestep.org, and we have a special issue in rangeland ecology and management that came out last fall um, that features some of the results through years three and four. A lot of collaborators, uh, just about everybody who's doing work in the Great Basin, or at least certainly a lot of them, uh, are collaborating on the project. You can see the logos there. And again, the major theme today would be the uh, um, how our results inform the question uh, of the differences in the meaning of restoration. We talk about restoration a lot. It has its uh, it has a uh, a definition from the ecological literature. And I'm going to cover four different fields of uh, research that we've uh, uh, performed in the Sage Step study. Uh, hydrology, primarily sediment transport and erosion. Uh, vegetation, uh, primarily herbaceous vegetation response. Uh, butterfly abundance and uh, sage obligate birds. And I'm going to illustrate the differences in what restoration means for these four uh, different uh, study groups. Okay, uh, sage, um, sage step covers the uh, two of our biomes, the uh, Wyoming big sage, treeless big sage, uh, primarily 8 to 12 inch precip zone, and then the encroached sagebrush step, the woodland encroached PJ, which is a, a 10 to 14 inches or so of precip. We've got 12 sites in the woodland experiment and six sites in the, what we call our sage cheat experiment. And most of you know the issues in the woodland. Uh, the map on the left shows the, uh, in the red, the uh, predicted uh, continuing encroachment of trees into sagebrush step. That map was made 12 years ago, and a lot of that red has, uh, has come true. And you can look at the photos on the right, taken by Robin Tausch, 
32 years of difference in uh, sage encroachment. And if you look carefully, you'll see that uh, primarily the, the biggest reason for expansion of, uh, of the pinyon juniper in that sagebrush step system uh, is really just tree growth. Uh, so a lot of the trees have just grown. So most of the colonization of the trees probably occurred by the 60s and 70s, and we're just watching infilling now. And of course, the, one of the biggest problems is that uh, with these woodland systems is that we get increased intensity of wildfire uh, when, when wildfires burn through them, among other things. And the treatments that um, the, the BLM and Forest Service have used and, and we're studying um, uh, include uh, doing nothing at all, upper left, uh, doing stand replacement prescribed fire, upper right, uh, clear cutting, usually removal uh, of trees uh, or burning, but we just cut them down and let them lay. And on the uh, bottom right, um, shredding or a mastication treatment. So we applied these treatments in 06, 07, 08, and our final site implemented in 09, South Ruby. So we're essentially Sage Step is a, the woodland experiment is a management experiment where we're, we're studying the effects of uh, typical kinds of uh, tree removal uh, treatments. In the Sage Cheat Study, lower elevation, uh, Wyoming Big Sage Lands, the map on the left, uh, the red areas, again, 12 years ago shows uh, areas that were projected to become uh, cheatgrass monocultures. And a lot of those areas have indeed turned that way. And uh, you see on the right, uh, the two photos, uh, healthy sagebrush step on the upper right, and then uh, highly encroached understory of sagebrush step in the lower right. And most of us know that once a fire happens, the, in the lower right case, we're just going to get cheatgrass back. Um, so we want to try to avoid that. Uh, most of the, our sites really are more of a mix of those two photographs, certainly not completely an understory of cheatgrass, but a mix of bunch grasses and cheatgrasses. And we're interested in uh, seeing what uh, influence uh, woody removal of the shrubs has on the herbaceous, and in particular the balance between uh, cheatgrass and the native perennial bunch grasses. And of course, uh, again, uh, we get fires, wildfires into these uh, uh, cheatgrass understories, and this is what we get. And in the sage cheat experiment, we had four treatments, we, uh, including nothing at all, upper left, a stand replacement prescribed fire where we take out the shrubs, or at least uh, we try to blacken about, uh, take about half the shrubs out uh, in terms of cover. And then mowing down uh, or lower left, uh, we try to remove about half of the cover of sagebrush uh, by mowing. And then uh, tebithion, which is a uh, herbicide that uh, focuses on uh, broadleafs like sagebrush. And we try, again, we try to reduce the cover of sagebrush by 50%. And again, the, the, the rationale behind these treatments is to study the release of the herbaceous vegetation after woody vegetation uh, changes. And in, uh, as a final treatment, we applied imazepic, which is an annual grass, an emergent uh, grass uh, herbicide, in uh, about half our uh, measurement plots in each of the main treatment plots to study uh, how direct killing cheatgrass uh, influences the balance between uh, cheatgrass cover and the perennial bunch grasses. Many sites, and you'll see that the, uh, uh, the sites in, that are symbols in green are the woodland sites, and the orange symbols are the sage cheat sites. With many sites, we're able to explore conditional response because every site is different, has different factors and conditions, and we're, better, uh, we're able to get better site-specific information. This study is also multidisciplinary, so we're studying vegetation and fuels, of course. Uh, we're studying soils, um, hydrology, wildlife, uh, insect biodiversity, and then we've got an economic and a sociology component. Uh, both of those have concluded, and they were um, focusing in on the cost and social acceptance of our uh, various treatments. So it's a multivariate study. It allows us to explore ecological interactions and relationships and allows us to assess trade-offs where they occur. 
The study is also uh, unique in that um, the plots, the treatment plots, where we apply these uh, uh, fire and cutting treatments, um, the plots are a very large size, between 20 and 200 acres. Here's an example plot, Greenville Bench, uh, the burn plot. Um, and you can see on that plot that it's uh, sizable. Um, there's uh, the nape background there, the trees. And if you look at the squares uh, the, uh, with the dot in the middle, those are veg uh, uh, vegetation measurement subplots. And you can see that they cover uh, the invasion gradient of uh, trees. So some of them, uh, the nape background shows uh, a high density of trees. Others uh, appear to be in the uh, shrub areas. And um, that allows us to understand the phase effects, uh, the initial tree cover or density effects on the ultimate vegetation response. Uh, because most of us uh, assumed before the study started uh, that uh, phase three woodlands where you have high encroachment of trees without much of an understory, uh, you, uh, you're risking getting a response maybe that, that uh, might not be tolerable. And so we want to know what those phase effects are on the response. And in this plot, you can also see all the other components of the work that we're doing. We're, uh, we're measuring uh, birds. We have a bird point count right in the middle, the, the bee, the butterfly transect. Uh, is that uh, dashed line that goes throughout the plot. We've got soil sampling and soil moisture sampling and a weather station in this plot. And all of the 70 uh, study plots have this um, uh, this kind of design. And uh, if you look at a graph between, uh, this is a pretreatment graph at Greenville Bench um, of tree cover on the x-axis and understory cover on the y-axis, we see the familiar relationship of uh, a negative uh, relationship for the control, fire, and mechanical plots. And um, uh, you see that with increased tree cover, you get a depression of the understory. And that is essentially the biggest problem with tree encroachment, is you lose that understory. First the shrubs, and then the, the perennial uh, herbaceous vegetation. Um, if you look at the, uh, uh, if, you, if you wanted to treat this, so if you treat it with either prescribed burning or with, uh, say, a mastication treatment, in other words, you remove the tree cover, um, what we're interested in is, is there a threshold in understory cover below which uh, we're going to have problems in restoration? Uh, so in other words, uh, below that horizontal uh, green band, a uh, blue band, are, are, are we going to have troubles uh, when tree cover is that high? Because there's not much um, pre-treatment understory cover. And so if you remove the trees, you've got nothing left. Uh, in the understory, well, what's going to come in? Is it going to be cheatgrass? And certainly that's what we're worried about. So we want to see if that line comes up by removing trees in the fire and mechanical, if it comes up uh, to a horizontal line in time. That's what we're hoping, and we're hoping that what it comes up in in terms of understory cover will be the native perennial herbaceous material and a little bit later perhaps the, the shrub component. All right. Now, uh, oftentimes, um, uh, we get very good vegetation response. Uh, if you look at this uh, Anaki site where we did our hydrologic work, the upper left shows immediate uh, post-fire, uh, uh, what, what it looked like just after we burned it. And, uh, and then in the lower right, you can see the uh, uh, six years later what the native perennial bunch grasses did. And so that is a very favorable response. Uh, you, can, you can see almost no cheatgrass there. So um, we're hoping that this happens all the time in every case. But, uh, but we'll see that that is not true and that there's a huge amount of variability. In any case, the most Im uh, important thing that this slide illustrates is that it takes, does take time for vegetation to recover. And probably we're talking 10 years before we can get a really good idea of, uh, of what the ultimate vegetation response will be in these sites. So this photo shows six years. Um, uh, in 10 years, perhaps, uh, we'll know a bit more. OK, so let's look at the, the four disciplines now, uh, starting with hydrology. And uh, this is work that uh, is done by the ARS lab out of Boise 
uh, Fred Pearson and Jason Williams and others. And essentially, it's a um, they used uh, artificial rainfall inside these tents. There's a small plot. They did bigger plots and also hill hill slope um, scale uh, work on sediment transport and erosion. And what they found when they first studied this was, if you look at the lower right photo, you'll see a phase three woodland, um, and you'll see what the understory looks like. And so you can imagine that if you put that on a slope, and that slope is anything like even 8, 10, 15 percent, uh, and you run water down that slope, you're going to have problems with erosion. And that's what this graph shows. It shows that as the percent bare soil um, and rocks increases, uh, your sediment yield increases exponentially as you as you get beyond 50 or 60 percent uh, bare soil coverage. So this is in the pretreatment untreated condition of phase three woodlands. And this is essentially the problems, the problem, the main problem hydrologically with uh, encroached woodlands. So then if we treat, um, this graph shows uh, just a year after treatment. And uh, if you look at the, the burn, the, the solid black uh, symbols are the burn sites. And you see that cumulative runoff and sediment yield are much greater for the burn than they are for the others, for the untreated or for the, um, uh, for the unburned and masticated uh, plots. And so we're getting the familiar story short term that, um, that uh, treatment with prescribed fire because it removes the trees removes the litter from the ground surface and uh, knocks back the, the grasses, at least in the year after treatment, to the point where they're not influencing the hill slope, uh, impeding the um, runoff on a hill slope, you're getting significant amounts of runoff. And that really is a, a problem with the burn sites. But it doesn't last for long. And uh, the work that uh, Jason Williams and Fred Pearson have done this summer has indicated that, indeed, those uh, numbers are going to come, those symbols are going to come way down after nine years. And uh, to show you the difference in the perennial bunch grasses and some of their small plots, and you see the plots labeled in the top of 06 and the ones in the bottom on 2015, that's this summer, you see the tremendous growth of individual uh, bunch grass plants in these in these plots. And that's because they've been released from competition because of the removal of the trees. So what they're finding is that the bunch grasses are then increasingly able to impede and interfere with hill slope flow, therefore decreasing uh, movement of water and then sediment transport and erosion. And if you can look at some of these uh, larger plots, uh, the green material there you see is these uh, where they put a dye in and try to see the sinuosity of the uh, of the flows and when they put that dye in they can they can easily tell that if you look at the control in the upper left and then you look at the masticated in the lower right or even the burn you see that that uh, flow is intercepted and uh, there's more infiltration there's more interception there's more impedance of the flow and so they're, they're we don't have the quantitative data yet it hasn't been worked up because the measurements were just taken this summer but uh, they're going to get uh, significant uh, projected significant decreases in the amount of sediment moving down these slopes uh, after nine years after treatment, even in the burns, uh, prescribed burns, which uh, which showed uh, a lot of um, uh, erosion uh, early on the year after treatment. And again, uh, again, the uh, bunch grass growth at Onaki. If you look at the control, the upper left that they used, you can see that the ground surface is. Uh, definitely not as covered with bunch grasses as it is in the three other treated areas nine years after treatment. So we're getting this big bunch grass response at Onaki that really, uh, really is helping us on the uh, hydrological front. Same thing at Marking Corral, and the point I want to make here is Marking Corral, which is another site they did their hydrologic work, uh, it's in the PJ system in eastern Nevada. And you can see the three treatments that they studied there. And if you look in the lower right, uh, the difference in the burn uh, at Marking Corral versus the burn the lower right at Onaki. There's Onaki. There's Marking Corral. You can see the cheatgrass in there. Now, hydrologically, it doesn't really matter. The cheatgrass impedes uh, flow and uh, increases tortuosity and flow just as surely as the bunch grasses. So for, uh, in terms of hydrologic considerations, 
Um, cheatgrass or bunch grasses, uh, either one uh, works quite well. You just need some kind of vegetation response to impede that flow. And so for hydrologic restoration, if restoration means the reduction in hill slope erosion and sediment transport, then then all three of the primary active treatments, sage step treatments, were highly successful after nine years, even in plots for which the primary vegetation response was increased in cheatgrass cover. So that's a slightly different restoration objective uh, or definition than, uh, than for vegetation, which we'll look at in just a second. Okay, now when we, let's look at vegetation now. When we remove trees, and we're talking about the woodland study here, uh, what, what, what happens right away, in a, if you look at this graph, in years since treatment, all the way up to eight years, if you remove the trees either by burning, cutting, or shredding, you get an increase in the additional spring wet days in the phase three woodlands. So Phase three woodlands means that the tree density was very high, in most cases uh, percent cover perhaps greater than 20, 25 percent. And we remove, remove those trees and we get a huge burst in the uh, amount of available spring water. And that persists to eight years post-treatment so far. And so that's a lot of water. And the, the, the real important question then is, what vegetation is going to capture this water? Is it going to be desirable vegetation? or undesirable vegetation. In some cases, as uh, you, you saw this slide before, it's desirable. We get a tremendous bunch grass response here, in this case, prescribed burn. Here's a, um, here are four shots uh, from the sage cheat study. Um, we can get, in the upper left, a very nice bunch grass response in the mowing treatment. Uh, we can get a very nice uh, a bunch grass response in the burn treatment, lower left and also a, a forb response. You see the uh, flocks in the lower left. And then in some cases, seedling response uh, in the, uh, looks like that's the uh, fire plot, again, at Saddle Mountain in the, in the upper right. So those are all very favorable responses, and many of our subplots uh, showed those kind of responses. But there are also um, troubling responses like the one in the lower right at Roberts in 09, where you see the, that subplot festooned with cheatgrass. And we have many like this, uh, many cheatgrass. Uh, responses uh, which shifted the, especially in the burn, that shifted the uh, emphasis toward cheatgrass. And this is Marking Corral. And again, you can see in this case, this is the prescribed burn at Marking Corral that happened in 2006. So that's nine years later. And you can see um, the, the bunch grass uh, cover is very good, but also the cheat grass is very high. So it's a mix. If we look at all the sites combined and look at the, uh, the so these are all the woodland sites combined. And you look at tall grass cover, these are things like blue bunch wheatgrass and fescue. If you look at the upper graph, that's year three uh, since treatment. And if you look at the untreated as the baseline, that's what all three of the plots look like. And you see that uh, blue line going down with the tree and dominance index. If you look at the burn, the one just above it, you see that it's just starting to inch up at year three. So you remove the trees from those plots in the, by fire. And by year three post-treatment, you're starting to see a recovery in the understory cover, which is the y-axis. And then in the green, you see the cut. And that's where you just cut the trees down. Uh, either by uh, removing them by mastication or cutting, and you see that we get a much healthier response in the understory in that green line, all the way across the tree dominance index, and that uh, is starting to come up. If you look at the lower graph in year six, you see that for the mechanical treatment, the green line, you see that the percent cover of the understory is now inching up toward 23% all the way across the board. So that site has almost completely recovered all the way across the initial tree dominance index gradient. So even though that um, those plots were were uh, uh, originally in the state that the control, you see the control in that year six control, which is the blue line. That was the original state for those uh, for those cut plots, and they have really moved up and recovered. And that's exactly what we want to see long term: is a um, a replacement of that. Uh, the tree dominance by the understory cover, either the herbaceous forbs and, and grasses, and also by the by the shrubs. 
And, and if you look at the red line in the bottom, you see that the uh, red line is starting to come up too. And we project that by year 10 post-treatment, perhaps that red line will be up uh, close to the green line and will be full recovery. Now this doesn't, this, this is in the tall grass cover, so it's, uh, it's an important part of the story. Perennial forbs, a similar story. If you look at those graphs, I'm not going to dwell on them too much, but uh, it's basically the same kind of story. Although with perennial forbs, um, because their distributions are more patchy, uh, we tend to get a lot more variation, and so the lines aren't quite as clean. But it's the same story as the perennial grasses, tall perennial grasses. Now here's the problem is that even though those perennials really respond well to tree removal, cheatgrass also does. And if you look um, at the, um, the graph on the bottom, it's the cut line. And if you look at the year six versus year three, year six is the dark blue uh, for all those plots that were cut. And you see that cheatgrass, the ratio of cheatgrass to tall grass is inching up up to at the highest tree dominance index, it's up above 0.3. So that means that um, cheatgrass is a little bit more than 30% of the cover of tall grass in the year six, and it's inching up from year three, so it's increasing. Same thing with the burn, even though with the burn you see that those ratios are even higher. Um, you see with the uh, uh, cheatgrass actually exceeds um, the uh, tall grass cover the, in terms of that ratio of greater than one uh, above about 80% tree dominance index. And so uh, with the fire, cheatgrass becomes more problematic uh, and, uh, and you see that it's inching up from year three to year six. It's not going down, it's going up. And even more troubling is the top case where it's the untreated case where we did nothing at all. And you see what's happening there is that um, cheatgrass is going up to, um, in year six now, is up to about one-seventh of the cover of, uh, of tall grass in the untreated in year six, which is much higher than it was in year three. We have no idea what's causing this. Um, uh, the, you know, these are, these are trends that are happening uh, all across the basin, so these are averages. In some cases, it's not as significant as others, but clearly cheatgrass is, is increasing. Now, those lines that I just showed you all represent averages, and so now we want to look at uh, very quickly the, uh, one of the factors behind differences in the response of the cheatgrass and tall grass components of the system. If you look at the Anaki burn plot six years post burn on the top and compare it with marking corral, you see a big difference. About the same amount of uh, bunch grass cover, uh, perennial bunch grass cover, but a lot more cheatgrass in marking corral. And we think that's probably because of several factors, including the fact that the parent rock and the soils are different. Um, the uh, soils in the, uh, at uh, marking corral are more clay, uh, they're shallower, depth of bedrock is less. Their heat index is higher. They're on the west-facing slope versus east. The spring precip in the six years post-treatment is about a third of it was of what it was at Anaki. So a lot lower spring precip. Um, and then the pre-treatment cheatgrass cover was moderate at Marking Corral. It increased to high, and uh, but it was always low at Anaki. So these are the factors that we believe are probably responsible for the among site variation in the balance between cheatgrass and the bunch grasses. And if we model this, if you look at the left si side of the dashed line, we, we, we see all the factors such as tree cover, rocks, water holding capacity, that's WHC, precip, sand, solar, and we, we look at those, those factors as, um, as potential uh, drivers of both uh, pea grass at uh, time zero, which is pretreatment, and cheatgrass at time zero, pretreatment. So we, we, and then on the right side of the dashed line is uh, we look at uh, those same uh, variables uh, post-treatment, and we try to use multivariate analyses 
to factor out, to kind of figure out which factors are most important. Now, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly, but you'll get a copy of this slide presentation, and I'd be happy to, um, to visit with any of you who want to learn what this uh, technique, uh, how this technique works. Uh, this is structural equation modeling. Uh, so I'm going to go through it probably too fast for you to understand completely, but um, we can start drawing lines uh, uh, based on what our data say. So, for example, tree cover is negatively related to shrub cover pretreatment and also to uh, perennial grass cover pretreatment. Uh, you look at solar, the hotter it gets, the more cheatgrass there is pretreatment. Gaps at zero, um, if the gaps are big, um, uh, uh, cheatgrass is also uh, common. If the gaps are small, cheatgrass isn't as common. So that's the pretreatment situation. When we look at precip, we can figure that out with our data. And again, water holding capacity and sand, and we start to build relationships. And then we start, then we apply the treatment, and we can start to see um, what ultimately our system looks like. And, and a couple things I'll point out here. There's a lot of uh, data here and a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of relationships, but one of the most important things is the relationship between the amount of cheatgrass we have before treatment and the amount of cheatgrass we have after treatment. That's cheat zero to cheat six, very positive, strong relationship. Same thing with pea grass, perennial grasses, and but you also see that um, the perennial grasses in the post-treatment environment, um, the, the more perennial grasses you have, the lower gaps, the smaller the gaps are, because the gaps are defined on the basis of perennial vegetation. And then, of course, the bigger the gaps are, the more cheatgrass there is. And the final uh, uh, confirmed uh, structural equation model looks like this. And this is the one you kind of want to think about. Um, we had some things that came in that we didn't expect, like lichen and moss and their effect on perennial grasses and so on. But these are the kind of analyses that we have to do to sort out all the different factors that may be causing the change, the difference uh, among uh, plots all the way across our network in the balance between cheatgrass and the perennial grasses, because that's really the story we want to focus on, and we're not going to get there by typical univariate analysis. So I just wanted to show you this as, a, as an example, and again, I will be happy to explain this to anybody who wants to talk to me personally about it. All right, so six years after treatment, vegetation at warm, dry sites, cheatgrass has the upper hand, um, especially after fire, less so after mechanical. At cooler, wetter sites, cheatgrass and bunchgrass response is more balanced. At most mountain big sage sites, bun bunchgrasses are more dominant. And then at most woodland sites, the phase effects are modest short term, and we, they're starting to get more important at six years but we need to measure out to 10 years on the, uh, really on these sites before that additional soil water that's released by woody uh, removal uh, starts, to, uh, starts to disappear. And then many other factors influence the balance between cheatgrass and native perennials, and uh, only a multivariate analysis of the kind I just showed will clarify these. And the bottom line is for plant restoration, if restoration means that the balance and vegetation cover response is tipped toward native, if that's successful, then sage step treatments were successful only under certain conditions. Okay, and now to look at uh, butterflies and birds and see what story we're getting from these critters. First, butterflies. This is a graph that shows the effect size between um, milk vetch, which is a uh, astragalus species, across the woodland sites, the abundance of astragalus, and this is the effect size means essentially when you apply a treatment, either fire or prescribed burning, um, how much did astragalus increase or decrease? And if you look at the graph on the, uh, the x-axis, you see that it increased. Uh, astragalus was stimulated by um, as a forb was st stimulated by fire or mechanical treatments. And uh, if you compare that effect size with the effect size of uh, Melissa blue butterflies, uh, Melissa blues eat primarily as larvae, eat astragalus and lupin. And in fact, astragalus is probably their number one host plant, at least in the plots that we studied. Uh, there's a significant relationship here 
um, between the effect size of uh, astragalus uh, as affected by treatment and the effect size of the uh, Melissa Blue. So we can infer uh, that there is a larval population increase due to treatment. This illustrates the connection between butterflies and the native uh, perennial vegetation. Uh, they're intimately related to it, and really, um, when you measure their response to these treatments, that's really the story you get. So if we uh, think about butterfly abundance, um, in the pretreatment world, we're talking about plant species richness, which is going to be positively correlated with butterfly abundance, and uh, also native herbaceous plant cover is positively correlated. Um, cheatgrass cover we feel is mostly negatively correlated, but that's not demonstrated. That would be pretreatment. The native herbaceous plant cover serves as adult food, and is particularly the forbs because of nectar. And then the native herbaceous plant cover serves as uh, as larval food, both in terms of forbs and grasses. And the larvae of various species are specific to various uh, particular species of, uh, of plants uh, in the larval form. And so that's that's really makes up uh, and uh, helps you understand the connection between butterflies and the native plant community. Then we apply the treatment and we get a woody re uh, vegetation removal which increases soil water availability and then we see that the effects on the um, uh, of soil water availability increases native herbaceous plant cover, which increases butterfly abundance. Uh, the soil water availability also increases cheatgrass cover, but um, that relationship is not significant. And so butterflies don't seem to care about cheatgrass as long as there is native herbaceous plant cover available for them as a larval food and also for forbs for uh, nectar feeding. So. This photo shows at Blue Mountain, we took a, um, a shrubby site, burned it, and you can see what happened through a six years post-treatment. You see a lot of cheatgrass in there, but it doesn't really matter to the butterflies because what's important are the native perennials. So if restoration for butterflies means that native butterfly abundance and diversity were enhanced by treatment, if, that, if that's what success is, then sage uh, step treatments were successful in most places most of the time, mainly because butterflies have life histories that are closely linked to native vegetation, particularly the herbaceous, and the herbaceous uh, positively responded to uh, treatment of any kind. Now birds. If we look at prescribed fire effects, and we only st we study birds in relation to mechanical and prescribed fire effects, but most of our work was on prescribed fire. And we see, if you look at that line moving to the right, um, that's the treatment through seven years of time. That's where the plant community, the bird plant, uh, excuse me, the bird community went uh, after seven years of time, after we prescribed burn these plots. The controls tended to stay around the origin of the abscissa and, and the ordinate there, but the treatment moved to the right. And if you look where it's moving, it's not moving towards sagebrush because we use prescribed burning as our treatment. It's moving toward grassland. So the the bird community is moving is becoming more of a grassland bird community over time, through seven years of time. It is not becoming a sage obligate bird community. We're not getting that restoration of sagebrush obligate birds with burning. And the primary reason is you're removing the shrubs, which the birds need, and you're also even though you're killing the trees, you're leaving their skeletons on the landscape, which the birds won't tolerate. And so to birds, uh, uh, rest, uh, vegetation restoration isn't enough. And again, this, this graph shows, um, uh, if you look at the little ellipse right in the middle toward the uh, origin, you'll see where the bird community has moved in seven years, and you see that it's, it's squarely within that grassland bird community uh, still after seven years. The other place where we've seen uh, sage obligate birds move in is right on the edge of sagebrush step, open sagebrush step. If we do a mechanical treatment right on the edge, and we had two of our Anaki mechanical plots were on the edge where that ellipse is on the upper right, then we're getting movement into that area of sagebrush obligate birds, shrubland birds. But only if we get treatments that are adjacent to 
uh, open country sagebrush steppe so that the birds don't have to cross inhospitable territory. And only for mechanical treatments, because the mechanical treatments completely remove the vertical structure that the birds won't tolerate behaviorally. And so, for bird restoration, if restoration means that sagebrush obligate bird abundance was enhanced by treatment, then only mechanical sage step treatments were successful, and then only in very limited landscape conditions. So you're not going to get restoration of sagebrush obligate bird habitat if you do a, a mechanical treatment in the middle of a sea of woodland, uh, inhospitable woodland terrain. So the meaning of restoration um, varies depending on what you look at. For sediment transport and erosion, success uh, comes with the reestablishment of vegetation cover whether it's native or not. For vegetation, success depends on how treatment type and site factors influence the balance between cheatgrass and native grasses. And we, we want to try to get rid of cheatgrass for various reasons. And uh, so uh, even if a, a plot was judged successful from a hydrologic perspective because uh, cheatgrass recovered and impeded overland flow, we might not judge that as success in terms of vegetation. Now for butterflies, success depends on native vegetation, even if the treatment increases cheatgrass cover. So really, when you think about it, for butterflies, they're going to follow uh, they're going to follow resilience. They're going to for for um, for uh, sites where you have a treatment um, maintains or increases resilience, and that's based on the native perennial bunchgrass cover and to a lesser extent the forbs. That's where butterflies are going to do well. If cheatgrass is in those, those, those systems, it doesn't really matter that much as long as the native forbs and grasses upon which the larvae and adult butterflies depend are there, um, they're going to do fine. Uh, for sagebrush obligate birds, however, success hinges on the landscape position uh, and the treatment type. So prescribed fire doesn't work in the short term because it leaves dead skeletons. Uh, and a vegetation structure, which must include sagebrush, but cannot include trees, dead or alive. So the sort of the bar for restoration success for sage obligate birds is pretty high. The bar for sediment transport is relatively low, and it's a bit intermediate for the other two um, study groups. Okay, so that's it, and for more information, you can, you can get on our site. There's an abundance of other information. Uh, Lil Gilbert is our outreach coordinator, and uh, she works out of Utah State and uh, maintains this, uh, our, our um, website and, again, uh, newsletters a couple times a year. Uh, that's where you can find out uh, much more information than I presented today. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. All right, if you have questions for Jim, please type them into the questions pane of your control panel at the top right of your screen, and um, I'll forward those questions to Jim. Oops. There we go. Is that on? Yeah, it's on. <laughs> Thank you, that was great. Yeah. Well, while we're waiting for questions to come in, um, I know one question we commonly get is about grazing. And did, did could you speak to any differences being caused or not caused by grazing? Well, we didn't study grazing, um, and so we can't really comment on it in terms mm -hmm. of quantitative information. But um, I will say that, um, and I'll say this from my own perspective, looking at the these uh, these 70 plots, about a, um, most of them are fenced, um, and um, about one third of them, if they weren't fenced, um, I'll put it this way: the the the, um, the grazing intensity is so high that if they weren't fenced, we wouldn't be able to measure anything uh, come June in in about a third of our sites. A third of our sites are aren't grazed or are very lightly grazed, and the and another third in the middle. Are only uh, are lightly enough grazed to where perhaps uh, the bunch grasses, uh, the competition that the bunch grasses would be able to exert would still be reasonable with respect to cheatgrass. Good 
Great, thank you. All right, Roger Ferriel asks, what do your research results show for long-term control of cheatgrass using a Mazepic? Yeah, that's a good question. We, we, I didn't present Imazbic results. Uh, Dave Pike uh, and Scott Schaff have those results. Um, and basically what we found with Imazepic is we were hoping to get a, a big suppression in cheatgrass in the first few years after treatment, and we got that up through four years. But what we also hoped to get was because of that um, because of that uh, um, suppression of cheatgrass, we expected to get the native perennial bunch grasses to get a leg up during those years. And that didn't happen, uh, primarily because the, the um, shallow rooted perennial grasses, such as Sandberg's uh, bluegrass, uh, were also suppressed by Imazepic, as well as some of the perennial uh, native uh, perennial forbs, including particularly annuals. And the, the bunch grasses that were there more deeply rooted just did not seem to capture the sites as well as we hoped. So unfortunately, even though Imazepic worked beautifully in suppressing cheatgrass, it did not significantly shift the balance to, toward the native perennial bunch grasses. Great, thanks. It looks like the, all of the next three questions were about the mass effect, so. <laughs> yeah, and I would uh, uh, urge you to contact uh, Dave Pike, um, uh, Gino Shoup also at Utah State, Dave Pike at USGS, who have studied the Mazepic pretty uh, pretty thoroughly. Uh, I'd urge you to contact them, and they may have some recommendations. They may have seen some variation in the results that might suggest where you might be able to apply it more effectively and where it where it doesn't work so well. But overall, the results were uh, um, were not heartening, I'll put it that way. Well, all right, if you are still typing in a question, continue to type in. Um, but that was, that was the last in our queue so far, so I'll, um, say my closing spiel, and if more questions come in, then I will, then we can address them. Um, so uh, just to let you know, there will be a three-question survey of this webinar um, right after the webinar has ended, and I'll post the recording of this webinar to our Great Basin Fire Science YouTube channel this afternoon, um, just as soon as it renders. And uh, also tomorrow, the GoToWebinar system will send you a link automatically to, um, to that YouTube channel presentation as well. Okay, it looks like uh, another question came in. Roger Blue asks, did woody plant removal result in measurable soil moisture increase? Oh, yeah, I thought I, I showed that one slide it's about midway through the presentation, and it was for the woodland sites. Um, we haven't worked up the data for the sage cheat sites, but um, um, certainly when trees are involved, when you remove trees, um, uh, you you get a tr you know quite a substantial increase in soil moisture um, uh, throughout the spring. So in other words, and what it what it amounts to is that is that the um, the, so the soils begin as normally saturated in, in March, and then they gradually dry out from the surface down. And uh, when you remove trees from phase three, where they were very abundant and very dominant, you get as much as a an entire month of extra moisture available, especially a little bit deeper uh, than you did in the control situation. And as the years pass, that moisture is taken up by the herbaceous vegetation, and now to some extent, the shrubs coming back in. Uh, but even after eight years in phase three, we're getting a substantial amount of additional moisture available uh, after tree removal. And uh, we expected by year 10, we would start to see abatement of that um, extra uh, sort of water bonus, uh, but it doesn't look like we're going to see it because it looks like at eight years it's still it's still there. Now, if you go down to phase two, so uh, initial tree dominance that's um, say much lower, say um, uh, where you have a site that's um, that's uh, about equally dominated by sagebrush and trees, and then re you remove the trees from that situation. You get a water bonus initially that's about half of what you do for phase three. It might be 15 to 20 days in the spring on an average site. And then that attenuates fairly quickly with, with years after treatment. So by eight years, I haven't seen Bruce Roundy's data. These are 
uh, Bruce Rowney's data from BYU. Uh, but I think after eight years, you're probably not going to have much left. And certain, certainly phase one, where the trees are very small and you remove those, you're going to get a very, very small bonus of water on those. And most of that's going to attenuate by four years after treatment. In the sage cheat study, where we're just removing shrubs, you get a much lower bonus of water. Uh, for, available for the herbaceous vegetation. And we don't have those data worked up yet. I can't give you the numbers there. But you get some water release, but not much. Great, thank you. Retta Bruger asks, do you have any resources you would recommend for understanding what butterflies and insects are obligates of what perennial plants? Yeah, for butterflies, those um, the data are fairly well known. Um, <clears throat> although not as well known as I expected. For, for butterflies, the thing to do is just to go online and, oh, I can't remember the website. It's, um, I can't remember the website, but you can, if you just, if you just type in butterflies in their host plants, you'll get, a, you'll get a lot of information. And most of what you'll get will be um, uh, information that links uh, certain species of butterflies to certain plant families. Uh, so, for example, um, in some cases down to the genus level. So, for example, the, fr the fritillaries are a famous example. All the fritillaries are viola feeders um, as larvae, various species of viola. Um, the, uh, uh, some of the sulfurs are uh, mustard feeders. Um, uh, a lot of the whites, like Becker's white and, and, and those kinds of uh, critters are, uh, are mustard feeders. Uh, you know, it's just like cabbage white feeds on your cabbage, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and so, yeah, there definitely are some relationships there. Butterflies are, are pretty well known, but there are many other insect herbivores that have even more specific uh, relationships, um, especially, for example, the plant bugs. Uh, there are some certain species of plant bug that are that are uh, as as juveniles feed on only one species of plant, a native plant, uh, and but that's kind of the extreme. And where would you find that information for other insects? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, that um, for plant bugs, you probably go to the American Mu Museum of Natural History and get a lot of it because the uh, several of the curators there are plant bug specialists. Uh, that's probably a good a good place to start in the various uh, uh, their publications out of that museum. Okay, thanks. Jeff Klausman asks, are there future plans to look at active revegetation treatments, seeding or planting? Well, we've talked about that a lot because, of course, Sage Step is about treatments. Um, it's it was designed to be a study that um, looked at fairly inexpensive ways to try to shift the balance between cheatgrass and the perennials. And seeding and replanting are vastly more expensive. And so we, uh, Sage Step is all about treatments. Now, it doesn't mean that. And so, it's more like the conclusions would be okay. Under these circumstances, treatment alone is not going to recover your site. So you're going to need to do some kind of planting or seeding. That's the kind of recommendation we can make. Uh, but that's about it. Um, the team has occasionally talked about enhancing our infrastructure with some uh, seeding and planting trials, but nothing is, uh, nothing is on the horizon. Thank you. Matt Church asks, in the sage cheat study, did you measure any plant community attributes other than foliar cover, such as density or plant species diversity? If so, can you share some of the results? Oh, yeah. We have the, all the density information, but most of those data haven't been worked up. Uh, Rick Miller has worked up uh, uh, some of the density information on bunch grasses, uh, enough to know uh, that the response in bunch grasses up to three to four years post-treatment was primarily growth and not colonization of new individuals. So these are, you know, these, uh, especially these tall bunch grasses are long-lived. And, and so all we're really seeing here is a, uh, a, uh, uh, the, the growth of individuals that were already there before treatment. Um, now, in some cases, uh, especially with phase three woodlands where you didn't have any understory at all, there, there has been some colonization. And uh, I would have to refer to Rick Miller's, uh, I, I'd suggest to look at possibly Rick Miller's paper in the Rangeland Ecology and Management Special Issue of last fall. He might mention some density information in there, 
but uh, as far as I know, that really hasn't been worked up. It's mostly uh, cover because cover tends to be a slightly better metric to um, just uh, as it represents the um, impact or influence of a species on a site. Thank you. That looks like the last question. I just want to let everyone know that if you want to contact any of the people that Jim suggested and, um, and need their contact information, please email me and I'm happy to give that to you. Also, we are kind of in a website transition phase right now, so um, I'm not sure. Um, I'm hoping it will be just a couple weeks before we have this presentation posted to the website. But if, you need, if you'd like it sooner, uh, again, please email me. And my email should uh, be in um, the reminder emails for this webinar. And you'll also receive a follow-up email from the webinar system that will have my email. So it's emb at cabiner.unr.edu. It's difficult, so I would just wait for that follow-up email. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, go ahead, Jim. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to, uh, uh, Janie mentioned uh, the people, uh, the scientists that I mentioned, and uh, yeah, I, I won't repeat those names. They're, um, I, I mentioned the ones that I thought were most important for this talk. There's one that I left out, and that would be Steve Knick of USGS. He uh, is responsible for the bird work. And so I did the butterflies, he did the birds, and then I mentioned uh, the vegetation and hydro people earlier in the presentation. Great, thanks, Jim. So again, if you'd uh, like any further information, please email me at any time, and I will post this webinar on our YouTube channel this afternoon. All right, well, thank you all for your participation today, and thank you, Jim, for your presentation. All right, everyone, have a great day.